in Matthew. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to recap a little bit. Uh, again, I'm, we're going to study the book of John. And so far, we have studied a few things about Jesus. The whole thing about studying the book of John is really to see the character traits of Jesus, which he carries a lot, right? And so, so far, I'm just going to retrack. We saw Jesus early in John chapter 1. We saw Jesus, how he knows our future, right? You remember that? I shared how Jesus knows our future. He knows everything about us. Also, sir, that Jesus is coming back in glory. And uh, last, last week, I shared a, a, a side of Jesus to see Jesus as a compassionate God when he multiplied the water into wine. And today, I want to share another trait of Jesus and if you want to go if you go to could go to John chapter 2 and wait for me there but I want to share another part of Jesus we we thinking about think about the uh, well not Jesus is always good but you know many in the body of Christ don't realize that Jesus uh, it gets angry and so today we're going to share that and hopefully I can finish with another segment in John chapter 2. We're going to study Ch John chapter 2 and when I did these messages I wanted to, to you know, we can't just go and read the whole, the whole book of John. I, I wanted key highlights who, who Jesus is, how God is like and that's why I call these messages God Revealed. Now in John chapter 2 verse 13, we'll start in verse 13, we see one part of Jesus that uh, we need to pay attention to. It says there in the Passover the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop, stop making my father's house a place, a place of business. As disciples, remember that it was written, The zeal of your house will consume him, me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign... Uh, no, I stopped. Stop there in verse 17. So again, I'm repeating myself, but here we see Jesus getting angry. Now, why is he getting angry? Well, he's getting angry because he's in the house of God, just like God would be, Jesus would be here, and uh, and he was really he had a, he loved God, his father so much, and he saw. He saw them doing things that really got him very angry. So in a nutshell, it, God does get angry. Right? He does get angry. We see a different side of Jesus. We saw last week, we saw the side of Jesus where he is a compassionate God. But also he is a God that has a zeal, a, a zeal for his God things. And he wants us to live in that same mindset that he shows us here. Sometimes it's okay to get mad. Righteous anger avails much. It's okay to get mad when you see things that uh, are done in the, in the body of Christ, things that are done in the church, things that, you know, but how do we, how do we fight it back? Well, one of the first thing is when we see something that's not right, we should be, we should, right away, should pray for the situation whatever it is but the Lord is showing me that it's okay to get angry at certain things and you know if you remember if you remember in the gospel many you know I'm not gonna go there but if you remember many times he got really frustrated with his, his disciples right 
because he, he, he did things and he, he wanted, he confronted them and he, he got mad at them because they should have known better. But yet they didn't know better. They didn't, they didn't act in faith, they acted in fear. And I could, I could, I could uh, share with you many stories. And it's hard to really understand this, but I believe, this is what I believe, because I was asking the Lord this question. Now, if Jesus was angry then, in a book, it's written in the Gospel, right? If Jesus is, you know, Jesus, God never changes, right? So, if, if, could it be, could it be like, because Jesus came to the earth to demonstrate His Father. He came to demonstrate how He is like. Could it be when we fail Him, when we lack faith, when we should have faith and then we walk in fear, could, could it be that it makes him angry? We cause him to be angry. Now it's a righteous anger. It's not a anger that's really, but he gets, he gets frustrated with us. Now if that's the case, which I believe it is, I'm willing to really press myself and I challenge you to press yourself even more to see God, your word says this, I don't want, I'm going to apply my faith. I see you getting discouraged and, and anger, angry at the disciples when they lack faith. That means that when I lack faith, when I face a certain situation that fear, I have fear instead of faith, I am willing to sacrifice myself and I'm willing to press in more for faith so that I will please you and not make you angry. Could it be? You know, because Jesus came to demonstrate the Father. And that means that if He got angry there, that means that in the church, even in the church, if we would do things that are ungodly, He would get literally angry through. Now, I don't know what, but it's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of a angry God, right? It says, I think it's, uh, is it in Hebrews or in Peter it says that? But uh, Dan, you could... I'm not sure. Yeah, but anyway, there's a place that it does. It's a, it's a bad thing to fall in the hands of a angry God. Now, we need to see this side of Jesus. We need to see this side that, you know, we need to really press forward to really apply faith. And then maybe even, could it be that he gets angry when we're caught up in doing things that are, you know, we're talking about faith here, but doing things that are ungodly, like how we respond to people. How we allow jealousy and we allow certain things to happen? Could it be that God gets, gets angry at us? I don't know about you, but I don't want that. I want to please Him. Right? Here they were using the temple building as a place to do business instead of use, using it to pray. Now no, notice this. The church is a place to pray. Right? One of the greatest things we can do is sometimes I'm bewildered. I'm, be, I'm not, not saying it because I, I am bewildered that there are many, some, so many few come for corporate prayer. Now, if I, look back, if I look back at the beginning of the church age, one key point of revival was people gathering up together and pray. Right? Could it be that God really doesn't like it when we already are gathered to, to pray together corporately? Now, I'm not talking about praying at home. That's different. But I'm talking about gathering together. We all say, well, we want revival. Yeah, but the thing is to have, you know, if I see the pattern that God has when they went in one accord and they gathered together, then revival came. Then the world was touched. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus says my house is a house of prayer one key factor a church exists is to pray pray corporately pray together gather together and so that's what they were not doing that and of course we know we know that there is some churches they do all kinds of weird stuff in them right we're not going to go too much in there but you know we have to agree that there is people calling themselves churches and they, they even have parties in the bar in the basement and drunken stuff and 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 it's 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 it should not be i don't know about you but i don't want to make god mad at me i want this place i want us to gather together and please god in luke 
Uh, Luke emphasized this same scene when he said in Luke 19 46 he says it is written and my house shall be a house of prayer but you have made it a robber's den they made a mockery of the house of God and God Jesus was literally angry at this whole situation so just like Jesus did it's okay to get mad at certain things that Christians do at times especially when it, it comes from lack of respect for his house I speak about the house I remember a time going to a different denomination people would respect the house of God you wouldn't dare talk in the house of God right so we need to do the same thing to have respect for his house and sometimes we need to really, and like I say, I, I see this very reservedly, but uh, you know, sometimes we'll see things like certain Christians, Christians that call people that call themselves Christian, they will do or say, and we need to get mad in the spirit and pray. Because the key thing is to pray, not gossip, but pray. God, please touch them. Please show them, right? It can be many things in the body of Christ. It, it can be how they use their finances towards God. It can be about the lack of interest in church attendance. It could be a lack of interest while worshiping God. I was watching a video on, I think it was, uh, anyway, the whole intent of worship. Worship should be intense should be like worship is just not sing song it's really really literally connecting with god personally one-on-one -on -one. not something it's you know well singing and thinking about different things and my turkey's cooking or whatever no it's it's like or uh, it's focusing on what's happening beside us it should be like one-on-one -on -one. sure worship should be Holy, it should be not, should not be any disturbance in worship. We should be all focused on Him with our whole being. And so we need to pray for ourselves when we lack what I just mentioned. We need to see ourselves, and when we see others, they're not really measuring up. We need to pray for them. Not gossip, but to pray. We need to become sensitive to God and God's things. Right? And so one key element that I believe is missing in the church, in the body of Christ upon believers, is to fear God. Now, I'm not saying about fearing God like he's going to beat me on the head with a broom or a hammer. I'm talking about holy reverence for God. It needs to come back to the church. And this is really what Jesus was pointing the finger at. They did not have reverence in the temple for God. They were only consuming their own things, doing their own things. And we need to really refocus ourselves on God and having to fear God. Not just here in church, but at home, in our walk, in our daily affairs. To watch our mouth before we say something or to watch ourselves before doing something. Amen? So here we see that Jesus... He was, uh, he was, uh, he, hang, he, he got angry at times. Amen. So now I'm, I just want to jump to John chapter 2. Now we're going to study another part of Jesus that needs to be seen. Like I said, I went and my intent in studying the book of John and I'm working on another series. So during the year, the year coming, we're gonna, I'm going to give different lessons on the book of John. And I'm going to bounce from one to the other. But uh, for this message, it's called God Reveal. We're studying the character traits of Jesus. What he did, how he is like. And one other part, we can see another part of him in, the, in, uh, in, verse, in verse 23. Everybody there? Now this one goes deep. 
It says there, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believe in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, or he knew what is, was in man, another version says. And it, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now we're going to look at Jesus where he knows what is in man. We need to have the same same focus today this in the year in the times we're living in because the thing is I had many discussions this week with certain people that are Christians a few uh, a few I'm not going to name names uh, but uh, uh, but there's there's uh, there's cruelty there's literally we're at war did you know that we're at war now Jesus knew Jew, Jesus knew exactly what was in man what what, what is in man wickedness Wickedness. Why? Why is there wickedness in men? It's inherited by from Adam. Amen. It's the sin nature. The sin nature is in man. And our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and dark places, right? So Jesus knew what was in man. In man, if you think you're going to get your glory from man, I'm telling you, we're living in a time, if you're going to be hated, Jesus says, if, you're, uh, if they hated me, they will hate you. So get with it, right? Get with it, because people are going to hate us because we follow Jesus. And I had a few conversations this week, and maybe, uh, you know, people, and uh, they realized that. Now, some of them, one of them is a baby believer. And I said, hey, listen, I mean, it's going to happen. They won't understand. They're going to say bad things about you. That's get, just get with it. That's in the Word. And even in the body of Christ. Now, I see, many people don't realize that. In the body of Christ, hopefully it's not here. But the thing is, Jesus was really, really, he says, you're going to have wheat and you're going to have tares. Now, this is within the church and outside of a church building. People are going to profess being a believer, but yet they won't. They're not really believers. They're planted there by the devil himself. The Bible says so. They call, uh, Jesus calls them wheat and tares. Hopefully you're all wheat here today. But we're all going to have a battle. And the ones that, that Jesus is talking about here are tares. Are people professing being believers, but they're not. Planted by the devil. Or people that have never heard about Christ. And so we face that. So Jesus knew all men. Jesus did not put his trust in man because he knows what is in man. The ones who have not been redeemed or born again yet, that's one. The same goes for us today. We need to pay attention to what Jesus did. The ones who are not redeemed yet will hurt us at times. And even carnal, carnal Christians. We must realize that. that. Not everybody in their walk with God doesn't mean they're planted by the devil. But there's many believers today on the earth. I'm not pointing a finger at this church. I'm just saying this is the norm. Some are at different levels in their walk with God. And if they still have a part of carnal nature, in, you know, they will hurt you. Because they're not tapping in they're not tapping into the right tree, which should be Jesus, right? So we all are at a different place in our walk with God. And some people can be really selfish. Because mm -hmm. that's the nature of man, mm -hmm. right? If you're a, a believer that wants to love and trust everybody, you are bound to be hurt at times because some will realize it and will turn on you. They will use you. They will abuse you. This, I'm just talking very frankly here. We need, Jesus knew what was in man and we need to know what is in man. Now hopefully everybody here is saved. I believe you guys are. But it doesn't mean you will always be perfect. It doesn't mean that I will always be perfect. 
we need to tap into the Spirit of God. Because inside here, there's a fight. There's a fight between should I serve God or self, or I serve God. Right? So there's a fight in, in fight. And out of that fight, at times, if we don't watch ourselves, we're going to hurt somebody. And many, even in the body of Christ, without realizing it, they see somebody that loves and ready to do anything, they will use and abuse them. I've seen it. I've been used and abused a lot. But I know many here, you guys have been used and abused a lot. It's the norm. Should not be, but that's the goal of God is and Jesus in Christ. The goal is to bring us, Paul mentioned it many times, to maturity. The goal is to be a mature believer. But in the meantime, every one of us here are all at a different level. And at times we could hurt a fellow brother. Now the key thing is, is to really be open when we do, or before we do. How does that happen? That happens when you hear from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, don't do that. Mm -mm, don't even say it. But sometimes in, in, there's an internal battle inside and says, oh, I want revenge. So you, you say something or do something you really don't want to. And then there's regret. Then you grieve the Holy Spirit. That's, uh, that's the, the Christian walk. That's who we are. Hallelujah. So we need to be very careful. Sin nature causes some to say or do things that will be very painful at times. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this. We need to pay attention to that. It's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that I really is. We need to come to a place of not taking it personally. Nothing. We need to bear our cross. What is the cross? You know what you you know what the cross is? Or the sufferings of Christ, like Paul says? The sufferings of Christ is to learn to take it. Because Jesus says he knew what was in man. We need to know what is in man. Many times the enemy is gonna use people to hurt us, and hurt people hurting people will hurt people. Our part is to tap into what God is saying. It says, I refuse to hurt, to revenge myself, and you always apply love. Because love, like Jesus told me years ago, I wrote it down, is the most powerful force in the universe. If we learn to love our fellow brothers and, and sisters in Christ, if we learn to love our enemies, if we just learn to be in love with Jesus, because that's where it comes from. It comes from Him down to us, out to others. Amen? Amen. That's the key thing. It's to stay connected. Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in me. Uh, 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 and I will abide in you. Without me, you can't do nothing. What was He saying? He was saying, you need to be tapped into divine all the time. You need to be tapped into me. It's the only way. Then you learn to die to self. Because we love people so much, we then tend to trust them and some will take advantage of us and some will do it just to get something out of us. It, it's the norm. Some without realizing, they will try to take... Sometimes I wonder, wow... But then you realize some people did certain things because they just wanted to have their way. May we never be like that. I challenge you, if you see yourself, if you do that, stop it and just give it to God. Just acknowledge it. I guess the lesson here is that we need to expect it and, and move on by learning to forgive and understand that hurting people will always hurt people. See, every one of us is a different part in our walk. And even in the body of Christ, 
And if we are still hurting, that's the reason Jesus came. That scripture on the wall there is exactly why Jesus came. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because for, for of this He has anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim deliverance to the captives. We've got to see people as being captives. And you said to the blind, to set at liberty those that have been crushed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to heal those that are broken. Hurting people will hurt people. The key thing is to pray for them that God will supernaturally go inside their human heart and do a healing miracle in their hearts. In the meantime, we're going to face people that call themselves believers. They might well be a believer, but some are hurting. And some will hurt you, and we, you need, and I need to get on with it. Forgive. I know it's hard to forget, but the forgetting part is that we don't forget it ever happened. It means that we never focus still, focus every day on it, and on and on and on. I'm burying the dead, as a matter of fact. That's what I would say. So we need to get on. God wants us to expect it, to forget it. To, to forgive and then move on. Three points. Say it after me. Expect it. Forgive. And move on. Because that Paul, the apostle, was accused and many cruelties were done to him. But he learned one thing. You learn to move on. Right? And we need to do the same. We can all be self-centered at times, which will cause us to hurt someone we love without even realizing it by, by walking in the flesh. Every one of us has done it. Every one of us, hopefully, would be nice to say that we'll never do it again. But if you're not tapping to Jesus... If you're not full of His love, I'm telling you, you will probably do it. Mm -hmm. The key thing is to stay close to God. Because Jesus says, without me, you can't do nothing. And so we can read about this battle, and I'm, I'm going to... Uh, in Galatians, go in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Paul gives and shares the word on... A battle that's really, if you look at it, it, it is in us. I don't, know, I don't know about you unless you're perfect, but I see this battle in myself at times. Less and less. It says here in Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. See here the word flesh. That, that word flesh means your, 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 yourself, your old nature, your old character. It wants to come on the scene. But true love serve one another. Note here the word love. True love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite... And devour one another. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's the part that Jesus was saying, abide in me. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Say, we don't, sometimes we don't want to do. But when the Spirit of God says, don't say that or don't do that, that's the battle in it. You know, you, we have a choice. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evidence which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmities. This is a big one in the body of Christ. Strife jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, that's another one, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, 
Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I did not see this. God says it. Right? That means that this, our future, is at stake here. But this is how God wants us to react. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, big one here. Against such thing there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. This is my goal. I don't know about your goal. This is my goal. I want it dead. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another or envying one another. So a believer can become like that with others if they don't learn to check their hearts. Again, it's really abiding in Jesus. We as humans don't see ourselves, but Jesus does. And it's a good thing that as you mature in God, to ask Him to search your heart. The more you mature in God, the more you are, read this and the scripture brings you to that place. A mature believer will say, God, please search my heart. Please go down deep in there. Reveal to me all the impure motives, the impure things. Psalm 139, David. Many times God says, you know, you got to look at David. David was like that. And David says in Psalm 139, verse 3, 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of every last thing I challenge every person listening we need to see yourself as we truly are let's not be hypocrites raise our hands and worship and all along we're you know we have something in us that needs to be dealt with let's all come to that place Let's all learn to ask God to search our heart daily to see if there's any unclean thing or if we have hurt His feeling by our lack of faith and commitment in Him. Let us check our heart where we could have failed Him. Again in John 2.25 it says, For He Himself knew what was in man. Did you know we can't hide from Jesus? We can't. Jesus goes down deep in our hearts. I don't know about you, but I want him to go there, down deep there and really search my heart. And I challenge you to do the same. Amen? Amen. That's all. So we've heard, we've learned two things about Jesus today. We've learned that he gets hangry. It's a righteous anger. When we fail Him, or when we do things, or people do things that are ungodly. And then we learn this part about Him. Amen? Amen. That we can... He knows what is in man. He knows exactly what is in mankind. And so we need to remind ourselves that the same goes for us. When somebody hurts us, when somebody says something or does something that really is hard to take, remember, Jesus knew what it was in men. And some, you will, even if they call themselves believers, it doesn't mean they are at times. And it doesn't mean that they, they're not, but yet they're not mature enough yet still have issues our part as believers as you mature in Christ you learn to take it anybody with me this morning amen, amen. Now I want to focus a few seconds on the people that are not if they're not safe if you're not safe you might be listening on the internet you might be listening on PodPoint on YouTube but that means if you if you have not made Jesus as your Lord and Savior 
Jesus, we're going to be celebrating Christmas pretty soon. And Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us, came literally to make us part of his family. He came to live in humanity. He came to give life and more abundantly. And if you would die today, if you've never received Jesus as Lord, no matter how many people tell you otherwise, I am telling you, you're not going to heaven. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And my prayer and our prayer as a church is that every person has a chance to get saved. That's why we do these things. And I just pray that if you never received Jesus as Lord, now the Holy Spirit, if you have not, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. And all you have to do is at home, you just, uh, just ask Him to come and live in your life because He shed His blood on the cross for you. He shed His blood on the cross. And if you receive Him as your Lord, is your Lord and Savior, you, you're going to enter a brand spanking life. A life in Christ. You're going to be born again. Every mistake is going to be erased. All your past will be erased. And you will have a beginning, a new beginning. And also you'll have a home in heaven waiting for you. If you haven't done that, I challenge you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.